Hey Robot Makers, do you want to learn how to use MicroPython right from the very beginning? Then this is the show for you. Come with me as we build robots, bring them to life with code and have a whole load of fun along the way. Okay, let's get over to our keynote and we'll have a look what today's show is all about. So yeah, we're gonna have a look at MicroPython right from the very beginning. So if you're a learner, you're looking to get started with MicroPython, then this is exactly what this show is all about. So we're gonna look at what is MicroPython? Why is it even called MicroPython? Where do you get it from? How do you install it? Why would you use this instead of something like C++? The things that you need to write the code, IDEs, and we'll look at what IDEs are, and then we'll write our first program as well, Hello World. So let's get over to it, shall we? So right over my desk over here, I've got a number of different devices um, which are all MicroPython devices. So uh, Pimroni Tiny2040, we've got the M5 stack there. We have the Adafruit Bluefruit, which is a circuit playground device. We've got the Feather as well, which is also another Adafruit device. We've got the Microbit over there, that can also run MicroPython. We have the Raspberry Pi Pico, that's the one with the Pico W with the Wi Fi. We've got an ESP32 camera, there is an ESP32 Wemos D1 Mini, There's an e this is an ESP32S, and we've also got a couple of other devices as well on the end here. So we've got the the Pico LiPo from Pimeroni, which is an IP2040 MicroPython device. And finally, we have the Arduino. It's got a very long name, this one. Nano RP20 Connect. That one is also an RP2040 based board, similar to the Raspberry Pi Pico. So there's a whole load of devices that you can actually get to run MicroPython. Okay, so, so what is MicroPython? And why is it called MicroPython? So MicroPython is a small version of the programming language Python, and it's been designed specifically for these really small microcontrollers. They're all 32 bits, so that's one of the restrictions. We can't run MicroPython, for example, on an Arduino Uno. The name comes from the fact that it's a very small version specifically designed for microcontrollers. So that's where we get the micro bit from and Python, because it's based on the Python language. And Python gets its name from a TV show. So there was a TV show back in the 70s that was called Monty Python's Flying Circus that was a BBC comedy series and you can see in the quote that we have there when we began implementing Python Guido Van Rossum was also reading the published scripts from Monty Python's Flying Circus a BBC comedy series from the 1970s Van Rossum thought he needed a name that was short unique and slightly mysterious so he decided to call the language Python and it stuck very quick background of MicroPython. So this was actually created by Damien George with the initial release on 3rd of May 2014. So it's about eight years old as a recording of this show. It's actually a program itself that runs on the microcontroller and is itself written in the C language. And the logo for MicroPython is an M, but it's also a snake. It's like the snake's eye just on the end over here. So where do we get MicroPython from? So this can be installed on many different 32-bit um, microcontrollers, as we've just seen on our overhead over here. And you'll see a small thumbnail when you visit the micropython.org website. So if you go to micropython.org slash downloads, you'll be able to see all the different boards that are supported. There's a thumbnail image for each of them. If you click on that, you'll then open up um, a page specifically with all the different versions on. So let's go and do that now and have a look what that actually looks like. So I'm over here on my browser, I've gone to micropython.org and we're going to click on the downloads button. And then if we scroll down a little bit, you'll see all these different thumbnail images of the boards that we're interested in. So I'm going to look at the Raspberry Pi Pico today. So I'm just going to keep scrolling down until I get to the Pico, which is near here now. There we go, Raspberry Pi Pico. I'm going to click on that and we can see there that there's the firmware and the releases. So the very latest release of, as of recording of the show is 1.19.1. And we can see that was made on the 18th of June 2022. So if we click on that image there, it has a .uf2 file extension. So that's now downloaded to my, my local computer. I can now use that to flash the firmware on the Raspberry Pi Pico that we're going to flash in a second. So how do we install MicroPython? There's a couple of different ways of doing this. We could do this from the command line if you're familiar with the terminal. That seems a bit uh, over the top from a skills point of view. The easiest way is to get Thony. So Thony is another program and this is available for Windows, Macs and Linux computers. And all we need to do is go to thony.org, download Thony, open up Thony, and then we can start to install MicroPython. So I'm not going to show you how to download it. I'm sure you'll be able to do that part. But what I will do is I will show you how to install from Thony. So installing MicroPython using Thony is very, very straightforward. It's designed to be as easy as possible. So we're going to show you this uh, in a second. What we're going to do is we're going to click on the very right bottom corner of the Thony window. We're going to click on that. Uh, that's going to open up a, di a dialog box which enables us to install MicroPython. And then we're just going to click the install button. And hey presto, we've got MicroPython installed on our device. So let's go over to Thony and do that now. 
Okay, so here I'm in Thonny, and the very bottom right hand corner over here, uh, there's a little button. If we press this, uh, it might say something slightly different than yours. We can install MicroPython. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to get my, my board and I'm going to put it into the, the mode that we need, which if I just show this overhead camera over here. So here is my Raspberry Pi Pico. I'm going to hold down the boot select button and I'm going to push the cable in like so. And what that will do, that will tell the device to go into its boot select mode and be ready to have MicroPython installed on it. So if I now go back over to this button here, I can now see that there is an install MicroPython option that's available. We can also install CircuitPython, uh, but for this tutorial, we're going to look at MicroPython only. OK, so let's go full screen on this one now. So you can see here it says the target volume. So I'm on an Apple Mac, so I get this slash volumes. If you're on a Windows PC, it will look slightly differently, but not too different. Uh, and the, the name of the volume, it will be RPI-RP2. And what we're going to do is we're going to choose which MicroPython variant we want. And we're going to go with the most common one. So I'm using a Raspberry Pi uh, Pico. It's not the Pico W, so I'm just going to select that option there. And then going to click the install button, and you'll see there it says copying. And it'll just take it a couple of seconds to finish that copying and then we have MicroPython installed on our device. There we go. So we can click close and if I now click this stop button up here, we can now see MicroPython version 1.19.1, .1, which is the release we've in, we downloaded, is now available on our device. So why use MicroPython? Why not use something like C, C++ instead? So MicroPython has been designed to be easier to write, cleaner and clearer to read, and it's faster to get the results that you want than other languages such as C++. And when I say faster to get the results, I don't mean that the code is going to run faster. I mean, it's easier to write the code, run the code and get the results that you're after. C is actually faster by an order of magnitude than Python, uh, depending on what you're doing. In many cases, you're not even notice the difference, particularly for robotics, it's more than good enough to use MicroPython. So compare the two examples on the right hand side of the screen here. Very top, we've got some C++ code. So if you're writing this as a beginner, there's a lot of stuff in here that looks quite esoteric, looks mysterious. So there's a hash include speech marks stdio.h. What does that mean? If you're not familiar with C++, that might look quite mysterious. Then we've got the word void. What does void mean? Is it a black hole? Then we have hello world and we've got lowercase hello with a capital on W for the world. Some brackets, some squiggly brackets, print F and then some brackets and hello world. Then a semicolon at the end of the line. We've got the closing of those brackets. And then we've got this void main brackets, squiggly brackets, hello world brackets, colon close with squiggly brackets. There's a lot of brackets going on, lots of things like semicolons at the end of lines and things that we don't understand that we need to include. Compare that to MicroPython. Now, we don't understand what def is yet, but it says def hello underscore world with some brackets and a colon. Then it says print hello world and it looks like there's actually a typo there. There should be a and an, an extra speech marks at the end of that. Otherwise, we'll get an error. We'll try this code in a minute and see what happens. And then we've simply got hello world. So what's going on here is that we're defining a function called hello world. The function prints hello world to the console, and then we're simply just running it. That's the exact same code that's going on up here in C++, but there's a lot more stuff that we need to do there and a bit more knowledge required just to get those basic results. The only thing we need to know in here uh, is to, to use def and the brackets to define a function. We need to know the print command to print things to the console, and then we know how to run the, the uh, function, which is just by using the same function name on its own. We've also got a couple of characters indented there on the print, and that's to tell MicroPython that this is a block of code related to that Hello World program. So to write our code, we need an integrated development environment. We could just write this in Notepad or using something like Idle, which is the uh, integrated development learning environment for Python. But it's much better to use a dedicated editor that's been specifically designed to help you write code. So there's quite a few available. There's one that's called Microsoft Visual Studio or VS Code. That's my personal favorite. I use that to write code. I tend to use Thorny if I'm interacting with the the MicroPython device and I need to tweak things because it's actually easier to do that in Thony than Visual Studio Code at this point in time. There's also Atom, which is similar to VS Code. Uh, that works on all the different platforms, Mac, Linux, and Windows. We have PyCharm, we have Moo, we have Thony, which we're going to be using quite a bit in this tutorial. And we have Microsoft Make Code as well. So that's a web-based um, IDE. 
And finally, there's the Arduino IDE. Now, Arduinos tend to be uh, a form of C, C++ that's called processing. And that compiles code onto like a machine code that you then flash onto whichever board you're using. But they've recently updated this so it can now actually code in MicroPython too. So we're going to be checking that out later on. So the development environment will enable you to create faster, more accurate code with features such as autocomplete. So you start typing something, it will complete the word for you. It's got things like code hinting, which can help you understand what the parameters are for your functions and so on. I also has like line numbering as well, which can just really help. Uh, most development environments also have code highlighting. So as you type the words, they change color depending on what their meaning is. And it's quite a nice, useful extra thing to have compared to just a plain text. OK, so let's make, make our first example, shall we? So the tradition is when you're writing a program, the very first program that you learn to write in any programming language is Hello World. So we're going to do that right now. So I've got Thony, I've got my device plugged in, which is just over here. Let me just get that just in the screen there. So at the moment, it doesn't look like it's doing anything. You can't really see anything running on it, but it is there. And uh, we will be able to write a program that does something more interesting a bit later on. So the first thing we need to do is we need to print we need to have a bracket. We need to have some speech marks. Uh, I usually write my speech marks and close the brackets and then sort of back arrow into the between them. It's just easier and remember to close the speech marks out. And then we're going to type the uh, the phrase hello world exclamation mark. That's all we're going to do. We're then going to run this code. So if I just move this down, there's a green button over here that says run script. So if I click on that run script, we can see down here in this shell, it says hello world. Now that hello world program has actually run on this MicroPython device. It has run from that device uh, and then presented the results back to us. We can actually type things down here. This is called the REPL, the read, evaluate, print loop area. And we can type the program in here if we wanted to. So we could do hello, hello world and it will run that one line, one line at a time. So it's much easier to write your programs, I find, in this top area here. You can actually save everything that you've done, have many lines of code on there. Whereas down here, once you've written it, it's essentially forgotten about that you've written that. So that's our very first program. So let's get back to our tutorial and see what we're going to do next. So the next thing we want to learn about is variables. So variables are like little boxes. Uh, I always think of these pigeonholes. I used to work in uh, in education. We had this whole wall full of these little pigeonholes. Um, and back in the day, people used to keep pigeons in these little things and have a little door that they close it up. And then they would open the door, put a little message on the pigeon and let, let it fly away or whatever. So this is where these pigeonholes get the name. It's quite an antiquated way of uh, storing things but we used to have a whole wall full of these and you'd have like mail in there essentially just have notes and things packages that kind of thing and your name would be underneath the shelf from a variable point of view what are variables well when we want to store a value we want somewhere to store it first of all so we need some kind of area of memory in our uh, MicroPython device and we want to give it a nice friendly name so that we can find it again and really understand what it is without having to look inside it so in this example that we're going to look at we're going to store uh, the value one in the variable that's simply called a and we're going to assign it using the equal sign so let's go ahead and do that now so let's just remove that first program and we're simply going to do a equals one so let's run that code and nothing happens so what what's happening in the background is we've assigned that value but we can't actually see what that value is doing so if i just do a i can see what the value of a is let's do another one let's do it down here in the REPL. b equals two if i now type b and enter i can see b is two and if i say c equals a plus b guess what's going to happen going to be what value three oh, it's just gone off screen slightly there there we go so assigning values to variables is really useful if we want to do things such as let's say instead of storing um one in a variable called a that's a bit abstract let's store an age so let's store an age of 47 i don't know what that could be relate to and we'll on our little program we'll just print out age like so so we can use the variable name in our print statement and it will print out what the value of that variable is currently holding so in this case we've assigned 47 so when we print out age 47 is what we get back and we can do other things with variables we can store more than just numbers we can store things like name so let's say name equals um, let's say kevin and then let's print out name and let's run this little program so we can see there that we've, we've printed out 
47, which is the value of age, and we printed out Kevin, which is the value of the variable that's called name. That's what we can do with variables. We can store values in them, and then we can call them by a particular name. So when we think about variables, we can think of them as little boxes that store things, and we can give those little boxes names, so it makes it easier to read our code and understand what's in these, these variables. We can put things into boxes, and we can also compare what's in them. So we can say compare A with B. Let's have a quick look at what that would look like. Let's go back over here. So we previously said a equals one, b equals two. We can say a equals b, and that's not true. a doesn't equal b because a is one and b is two. If we make b equal one as well, oops, b equals one, and then we do a equals b, that's true because they are both the same. a is one and b is also one. So we can do kind of comparative things with them as well. We don't even have to look what's in them. We just want to compare, are they the same? If variables store things that change, constants store things that don't change. So why on earth would we want to store something as a constant? Well, say we've got a value that never changes. So the value of pi, for example, never changes. That's always going to be 3.14159265 and so on. That's never going to change. If we're doing things with triangles, with circles, with angles, sin, cos and tan, that kind of thing, then we might want to store pi as a constant and then be able to refer back to it. So it works very similar to storing variables, but the convention is that constants are always stored in uppercase. So we have like a capitalized pi. So let's go and do that on, uh, on Thunny. So let's clear out our program. Let's just clear the uh, the messages there. And then they say pi in uppercase equals 3.14159265.4. And the recommended way of doing this is actually to say const and brackets and then the value. Um, so if we run that now and we type pi, we can see that pi is 3.141593. It's rounded up a little bit just because it's a very long floating point number. Uh, it does actually have the full value stored in pi, but just printing it out to screen, um, it's going to do this. That's how we can store constant values. We can store them using the constant type, which is uh, this thing in brackets here. Let's have a look at uh, another example now. So we're going to head over to Thony again and we're going to write our second program. OK, so we're back over in Thony and we're going to write our second program now. This one is going to use variables. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do the hash symbol or pound if in the US. And this is how we can write comments. Uh, and comments are quite useful in your code just because it can help you remind things. You can keep notes and so on. What I always like to do is just type the name of the program. So this is like variables. I also like to type the date that I wrote this on. So I'm going to do 20th of November. 2022 and this is going to be a little program that does something with names so what we're going to do is we're going to say name equals and then input and then we're going to say please type your name like so so input is a new function that we're going to use and that will get input from the console and it will store it in a variable so we're going to assign it to the variable name so let's just have a, a little space and an arrow after that and then we're going to print out a message which just says hello and then comma and then name which is the the variable there so let's run this let's save this first of all so i'm going to save this one i'm going to save it to the computer first and i'm going to call this one example2.py and we can see there, there there it is and then we're simply going to run this so let's just click run so it says please type your name so i'm going to go down here and just type kevin and it says hello kevin so let's have a look again at that. Now, interestingly, print has done some nice things for us here, as well as printing out the word hello. It's also printed a space after the word hello before the variable name. So it just makes it a little bit easier to read for us. So that's the first thing we want to do. Now, let's extend this a little bit further. What we want to do next is bring an age in. So let's do a second line instead of printing out straight away. We'll say age. Oops, age equals input. And then please, oops, please input your age. And then we'll do a space and I'll put a space after them as well. And then on here, we can then extend this print statement out. So we'll do a comma, we will say, how does, and then age, and then comma, and then feel like so. So let's run this one. So type your name. So I'm going to click there and type in Kevin, type your age. It says, hello, Kevin, how does 47 feel? So we've done quite a few things there. We've assigned uh, some variables. One, we've assigned some, some what we call a string of text, a string. Uh, the second one, we've assigned an integer, a whole number. Uh, we can see it's an integer because it hasn't got a point zero or point decimal point after the, uh, the number. And um, we then just printed them out to the screen. So let's run this again. But this time, 
we're going to type in, um, so I'll do Kev on here. And for the age, I'm going to say 47.5. Oops, 47.5. And it says, hello, Kevin, how does 47.5 feel? So it still knows that this is a number, but it's treating it as a floating point number or a float, as we call it in MicroPython. Python can store values in different ways. It can store them as different types. So we've got things like strings of text. We've got integers, which are whole numbers. And we've got floating point numbers, which uh, are numbers with a decimal point. OK, let's get back over to our tutorial and continue on. So if you're enjoying this tutorial, um, please give me a like on the video. Give me a comment. Let me know if you're following along with this, what, what you think your skill level is. Are you a beginner, an intermediate or an advanced Python user? Have you used uh, any other programming languages before, such as Arduino, C, C++, uh, Lua? Let me know in the comments. And if you've not ticked the bell already, tick the bell, click the bell. If you've not clicked the bell already, give the bell a click and um, that'll also help the, the channel grow a little bit more. I do go live every single Sunday at 7 o'clock GMT. Today's actually an exception. I would normally go live on a Sunday, uh, but today I'm actually traveling down to Raspberry Pi headquarters tomorrow. So I want to uh, uh, get this one out uh, and I'll actually be traveling during the, the, the normal slot that I go live. So this is a bit of an exception today. Okay, and if you haven't already joined our Discord uh, server, you might want to head over to kevsrobots.com slash Discord. Join up there. It's completely free and you'll join a growing community of people just like you who are interested in electronics, programming and robotics. And if you want to follow me on social media, you can head over to uh, Instagram. I'm at Kevin McAleer on Instagram. I'm at KevsMac on Twitter if it's still around <laughs> when this the video goes live. And I'm also now on TikTok. I'm Kevin McAleer 6 on TikTok. So uh, follow me there if you can. And if you want to help support the show, there's quite a few different ways you can do that. You can do a super thanks. Uh, you can do a super chat if you're watching live. And if you go over to kevsrobots.com slash coffee, you can also buy me a coffee there as well. And uh, you'll get your names upon the, the credits as well if you do that. And if you also want to join the YouTube membership program, um, you can do that too just by clicking the join button um, at the bottom of the screen. I think you have to be subscribed before you can see the join button. But uh, give that a hit if you're already subscribed and you can join the membership program too. So supporters, yes. Thank you so much to everybody who's supported the channel so far. So we've got uh, three different groups of people represented over here. <laughs> I always get it the way around. Uh, so we've, we've got somebody uh, bought me a coffee this morning. We've got um, uh, Maker Schultz there. We've got Frank. We have uh, Dana Huff members. We've got Chemi. We have Steve Phillips, Thomas Weiser. And then we've also got new YouTube members. So we've got uh, Cheerlights. Uh, we've got Michael. We have uh, Fraser, Bill Hoy. Jose, we have Jeff, Johan, John Paul, and we have Tom as well. So if you want to see your name over here, get that the right way around, head over to kevsrobots.com slash credits and you can get your name in the credits as well. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this short video and I shall see you next time. Bye for now.